My name is Kevin Delaplante. I'm a chair of the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies here at I, uh, ISU. Um, and I'll be uh, chairing this uh, afternoon session of, uh, of our meeting. Um, I want to thank you all for coming and thank our speakers as well. Um, in this afternoon session, uh, we're starting off with um, one of our workshop organizers, Dr. Michael Dahlstrom. Um, Michael, uh, for those who don't know, is an assistant professor in the Greenlee School of Journalism and Communication here at ISU. Uh, he is a founding member of the Science Communication at ISU Research Group. Um, he, um, his current research focuses on the effects of narrative structure and the acceptance of science information and its role in, in correcting inherent biases in the attempt to perceive scientific topics beyond the realm of human scale. He holds a joint PhD in mass communication and environmental resources from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a master's in science and biophysics from Iowa State. Um, and he's gonna be followed up by Dr. Clark Wolf later, but I'll introduce Clark later. Go ahead. Thank you, Mark. <coughs> okay. Today I'm going to talk about uh, an ongoing project, which I'm calling Frames versus Narratives, a framework for ethical articulation in science communication. And what's driving a lot of this is this overarching question, how should a scientist communicate when offering expertise in the midst of a political controversy? Um, I, it's a large question and it's very important for a couple reasons. First of all, many of the current controversial policy issues contain a scientific or technical component. So we've already mentioned climate change, evolution, vaccines. They all, they're socially contentious, but there's a large scientific component. But also NSF and other organizations are requiring scientists to engage with citizens and policymakers through broader impacts. So the frequency with which scientists are going to be in this political context is likely going to increase. So we have strong impacts, increased frequency, it's an important question. Now one of the problems is that the influence of scientific information on policy decisions <coughs> seems to be declining. So you hear a lot of uh, decrying the use of science and policy, that policy is being made without taking science into consideration. Now I think it's important to say that science cannot instruct society what to do. Uh, decisions are based on collective values of society. However, confusion and mistrust of science undercuts the foundation on which these collective values can best be achieved. Okay, so what's the solution? Uh, this perceived lack of scientific influence has not gone unnoticed, and now there exists many um, initiatives such as the AAAS Communicating Science that works on uh, helping scientists communicate more clearly to try and increase comprehension, we have words like simplification, popularization, dumb down. We have this big body of technical knowledge. How are we going to sift that down into something that the public can understand? And while that is a very valuable and necessary role, <coughs> what is overlooked is understanding the normative expectations on which scientists will be judged on their communication. So an audience may fully comprehend the science that is trying to be communicated, but if that communication in some way violated a normative expectation, the content may be perceived as untrustworthy and is ignored. So I kind of think of this as the used car salesman. You know, the person may be telling me complete accurate information about this Volvo, but if I, if I perceive something as being shifty or in some way the communication um, isn't coming to what I expect, I'm not gonna trust that person. And if it's not trustworthy, it really doesn't matter. So what is needed is a clear understanding of what communication techniques are viewed as appropriate <coughs> for a scientist for a particular situation and audience in question. And then you need to pair those together. So you still need the clarity and the comprehension, but that needs to be paired with appropriate communication. Now the challenges facing this, number one is that there's not much literature on this yet. Um, scientific research and journalistic communication have long histories and traditions of ethical discussion and reflection. So I would bet that every, 
Everyone in here who's from a STEM field has taken some form of research ethics, and I know from our department uh, we have ethics classes, but even within journalism classes themselves, there's usually an ethical component worked into them. So th both of these spheres have strong ethical reflections. But the interplay between the two, the, the communication of science to a non-scientist audience, does not have that tradition. Um, one example, one of the few examples that does really try to consider the ethics of this interplay, um, Nisbet has a book chapter about the ethics of framing, and he offers four ethical principles for the framing of scientific information. One is to frame to promote dialogue instead of top-down communication. Two is to avoid frames designed to attack or alienate key publics. Three is to maintain accuracy. And four is to clearly explain the values underlying frame choices. We'll come back to these in a second. But that leads us to challenge number two. So those principles are about framing, but often communication techniques are often defined broadly or uh, permeate so many different disciplines that their conceptualizations are, are somewhat different. So for example, we'll, take, we'll look at frames. Frames are discussed in many disciplines, um, economics, psychology, sociology, <laughs> linguistics, communication. They all have some idea of what frames are, but the definitions are all kind of varied, so it's really hard to nail down what, what frames are. A second issue is that frames are confounded with narrative. A lot of times uh, when discussing frames, people will either interchange the word narrative, what's, what's the frame of this, or what's, what's the narrative you're trying to say? Whereas narrative is its own communication construct uh, with its own literature and own ethical considerations. So I'm gonna take that question from the very beginning and put framing into it. So the question becomes, what types of framing are appropriate for scientists within a policy context? And when does framing shift into appropriate spin? Now to explore this question, we first need a clear framework between frames and narratives. We need to understand what these are. And then on top of that, we need to map ethical considerations uh, based on what are some considerations for frames, narratives, how do they differ? The purpose of this article is to do the first aim, to develop a conceptual framework disentangling frames from narratives. Um, because of the spread of disciplines that we already discussed, um, I need to limit the scope of what I'm going to look at. So I'm gonna try and disentangle frames from narratives within the communication and psychology fields. And so for the rest of the presentation, what I'm gonna do is review some literature for both constructs, frames and narratives then build a framework that tries to disentangle what these conceptualizations are, and finally begin to map potential ethical considerations onto this. So I'm gonna be very clear right up front, the question of when does frames become spin, I'm not gonna answer that for you today. I'm gonna hopefully set up the first step that will allow us to continue. So I don't want you to be disappointed. Okay, so frames, what are frames? Frames are focusing on certain information while excluding others. It's basically a selection effect. And frames and the selection of content strongly influences public opinion and audience interpretation. One thing I think needs to be said is framing is often a derogatory word in STEM fields. There's a perception that science should not be framed. Um, that's something more rhetorical and we should just get the objective information out there. But framing itself is unavoidable. unavoidable. First of all, there's a need to select content. Whenever you choose to communicate, it's impossible to say everything, and then that selection itself is part of a frame. But framing is also a consequence of using language which associates effective valences with particular words. And you just, the, you can't get away from that. So for instance, let's say um, a scientist has developed a new medicine or a new compound that has medicinal qualities. <coughs> when asked about that, what, what was developed? Was it a cure? Was it a medicine? Was it a drug, a treatment, a compound, a chemical? All of those words may be exactly accurate. That's what happened. But they all carry very different meanings when someone hears about it. A cure is very positive. A treatment, maybe not. A chemical, depending on who you are, might sound quite bad. So there's no way to get away from framing. So rather than reject it, I think this just emphasizes the need of, of this question to understand how 
to frame ethically while still maintaining scientific integrity and accuracy. One problem uh, with frames is that it has been called a fractured paradigm in 93. And again, this is because of all the different disciplines that are working on it. So I think I have three quick examples of some definitions that are quoted a lot just to kind of show how we're talking about the same fuzzy idea but, but quite a bit of a spread. So a frame is a central organizing idea or storyline that provides meaning to an unfolding strip of events, weaving a connection between them. Frame is also to select some aspects of a perceived reality and make them more salient in a communicating text in such a way as to promote a particular problem definition, causal interpretation, moral evaluation, and or treatment recommendation. And also, frames represent organizing principles that are socially shared and persistent over time that work symbolically to meaningfully structure the social world. So we're all s talking about a similar construct, but it's a little bit different. So in an attempt to clarify this fractured paradigm, Shufula uh, published a seminal article that breaks up frames into a multi-level process. So first, there's frame building, which are the message factors used to create interesting and comprehensible stories. So those are the actual uh, selection, the word choices, what goes into creating the message. But then once that message gets to an audience, audience frames are the individual mental schema that are used to interpret that message. So in essence, the frame within the message, the content, interacts with an individual's pre-existing mental structures or their mental frames to influence how an indi individual understands and responds to the message. Now the frame building process is uh, widely manifested in science communication where scientists, political elites, interest groups, policymakers, and journalists often attempt to influence how science information is presented. Uh, in that same book chapter, Nisbet identified a list of frames that are commonly used in science-related policy debates. So we have economic development, competitiveness, morality ethics, scientific technical uncertainty, Pandora's box, runaway science, middle way, etc. Now, this list represents an example of a frame, frame conceptualization that exists at a high level with regard to the content. So it's very similar to the theme of the information. And so I'm going to call these thematic frames. They describe the overarching meaning of a message. Um, they're also referred to as meta-narratives, grand narratives. Similar constructs are narrative frames or story skeletons that try to describe, uh, that try to use existing storylines to leverage a particular theme. So for instance, we have David and Goliath as a narrative <laughs> frame. Um, it references a story, but at the same time, uh, it's a story skeleton because you can put in uh, new characters, new developments, something to make that idea, that, that story of big versus little, into a message. In contrast, what I'm going to call content-specific frames, these are frames that exist closer to the level of the content and often dictate specific choices in message construction. So the first two examples are frame examples where the depiction of a number how you depict an, uh, an equivalent number can have impacts. So loss gain frames, do you say that the medicine, that hypothetical medicine we, we develop, it has a 70% success rate or a 30% failure rate? Completely equivalent, but success rate is positive. If you present the information that way, more people will support it. The other way is negative. You have probability versus frequency presentations. So, uh, Let's say there is a side effect. The side effect will affect one out of 100 people, or you could say it will affect 1% of people. And it turns out that the 1% is much less frightening than one over 100. Um, one example that I think is, is really, really fascinating, this was a study done on medical professionals. So this is not lay public, but these are, these are professionals. And it was asked, and I, I may have the numbers wrong, but it's the same idea. It was asked, okay, you have a, a mental patient with violent tendencies. Um, should we release them back into the public? There is a one in 100 uh, chance that this person will be violent again. And another group said there's a 1% chance that people will be violent again. 1% um, 
chance. We'll, we'll, we'll go the other way. More, it's more impressive. One over 100, um, they said, you know, that's, that's a serious risk. You know, we should not let that person back out into public. Uh, the professionals that said there's only a 1% chance that this person will have, a, have another violent attempt. Okay. You know, it's, I'm more likely to say let's let that person out. So, so just the mere frame of a number can have a big influence. Likewise, there's targeted frames which are designed to resonate with a particular audience and again requires using specific types of content. So for instance, um, if you're talking to a religious audience and you want to resonate with their worldview, with their audience frames, you might use a word like stewardship, which resonates and makes sense. If you're talking to more of an environmental audience, you might use the word sustainable. Right? Very similar. Um, the message you're trying to get across could be the same, but by choosing these words, you might resonate more with that particular audience. These content-specific frames, I say, represent a different type of framing, one that dictates content rather than merely focusing it, like the thematic frames. So within this, where does narrative fit? The complementary construct of narrative is woven within. So for instance, narrative and story are used interchangeably, like we said. Um, Meta narratives, grand narratives, narrative frames are actually closer to thematic frames than they are to how narrative is discussed in the literature. So while it's clear that both overlap, um, the danger in a lack of conceptual clarity is in overlooking possible ethical considerations that differ between them. Okay, pause on frames, we'll move to narratives. What is a narrative? It's a causally linked temporal sequence of events involving specific human-like characters. The cause and effect structure is the glue that holds narratives together, require a beginning, middle, and end. Basically, it's a story, um, what we think of as a story. So if I said, you know, let me tell you what happened on the way to the symposium, I'm about ready to tell you a narrative. It's a sequence of events over time on human intention. Now, one thing about narrative is the comprehension of narrative is often contrasted with that of logic based argumentation. So logic must be learned using a specific cultural toolkit, while narrative is innate and can cross cultures. Logic is normative, while narrative is descriptive. So in other words, what makes a good logical argument does not make a good narrative. And some of the major differences between logic-based argumentation and narrative center on their treatment of certainty, context, and truth. So regarding certainty, logic-based argumentation usually seeks to communicate using the maxims of clarity, relevance, and truthfulness. Whereas narratives seek to subjectivize information and communicate about human possibilities rather than certainties. Narratives also create implicit rather than explicit meanings and depict reality through the sub subjective views of a character. So there's difference in how certainty is used. Context, logic-based argumentation, it deals with the understanding of facts and basically each fact can be transferred independently. So I can tell you this fact in this context we can go somewhere else, I can put it in another context, and it's still true. Narratives, because they represent uh, a mental representation of life, they are context dependent. So I can't take something out of a narrative and show it to you without it completely losing the meaning. I have to present the whole narrative. And also truth. Logic-based argumentation searches for universal truth and is judged based on the accuracy of its claims, whereas narratives search for connections between events and are judged based on the verisimilitude of their situations. So this difference um, kind of parallels the difference between deductive and inductive reasoning. Logic-based argumentation uses abstractions, talk about truth, so you're able to generalize to something specific. Whereas narratives tell you something very specific, show you an experience, so you can generalize abstractions from that single exemplar. And what this does is this confusingly allows arguments and narratives with opposing assertions to both claim equal levels of truth. So we have two, two pathways. Research suggests that they are not equal, not even close. Narrative text is recall, recalled twice as well and read twice as fast as logical text. Narratives generate greater interest and engagement, especially in science. And the perception of narrative events changing over time provides a mental simulation of how the world works and also limits the possibility of choices within the narrative. So it makes the resolution seem inevitable, as if there could not be any other way. 
So this uneven distribution has caused some scholars to say that narratives are the basic mode of human thought. I mean, we think in narratives, um, and if we want to think logically, that takes more work. We can do it, but we'll fall back to narratives. And uh, it, uh, Niles has even claimed that uh, narrative is what defines humans as a species and calls us homo narrans. Now the power of narrative, uh, they have the power to unobtrusively change perceptions by creating meaning with a veiled normative component. So narratives imply strong normative assessment, what's good, what's bad, but it never, it rarely states or defends the assumptions on which it's based. It shows you something being good or bad, but it never logically tries to say why this is good or bad. So because what makes a story different, a good story different from what makes it true, incorrect narratives are rarely influenced by logic and instead require a more convincing narrative to counter that narrative. And the fact that narratives are able to do this um, makes it difficult to counter them rationally. So a tangible consequence, vaccines and autism. So to set the stage, the scientific studies have found no link between vaccines and autism, but parent groups have mobilized under a convincing narrative about a child being diagnosed with autism just after getting a vaccine. And what I think this represents is a strong logical argument. Here is a science-based logical argumentation in direct contrast with a very strong narrative. Now, when asked about the growth of the anti-vaccine movement, um, Deputy Director of the National Immunization Program said, this is like nothing I've ever seen before. It's an era where it appears that science isn't enough. And I, I'd argue that rather than merely a diminishing faith in science, it's probable that these are two processing uh, strategies that are in, in competition. So people are processing similar information, but they're doing it com in completely different ways. And that could be adding a lot to this conflict. Now briefly, narrative persuasion is a, is a sister field within narrative that examines how communication practitioners can take advantage of these aspects of narrative to persuade someone about a message. Um, a common barrier is the formation of counterarguments for logical communication. But one thing with narrative is through transportation. When someone is reading a narrative, the more that they're transported into the narrative, the more they lose the ability to, to activate mental constructs. So it's, it's harder to generate counterarguments. So the acceptance of narrative evaluations is described as default. If I'm transported into the narrative, I'm basically going to accept it. Afterwards, I can then scrutinize it and maybe come up with reasons to discredit it. But that, again, takes more effort. And when making decisions, people do not always consider the risks and benefits, but often recall relevant cases and base their decisions on the outcomes of those cases. So something's happening. I remember back to something that happened that's similar, and I will base my response on, on the outcome of that case. Now, cases come from, of course, our direct experience. Touch the stove, burn my hand. That's a direct experience. But it also comes from others. So I could watch someone else uh, burn their hand, and I learned that. But I could also hear a story about that. Now, burning your hand is you know, pretty obvious. But one thing is that fiction versus nonfiction narratives don't seem to have much of a difference. So it turns out that um, taking cases from narratives, the source cue, whether or not this came from uh, a doctor's brochure or whether it came from watching House, fairly recently that source tends to dissipate and the case starts to be weighted equally. Um, as evidence, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has a program that works with television producers to ensure accurate portrayal of science in sitcoms and other primetime television because they realize that what, even in fictional things that are com should not be accepted as truth, they have that effect. They're trying to get some accuracy there. So in summary, narrative communication presents powerful opportunities for increased comprehension of science information. But the truth of a narrative is judged much differently than the truth of a logical argument. And narratives influence perceptions not through spirited debate, but through a whisper of suggestion. <coughs> okay, so now the challenge is how to try and separate these two out. And what I'm going to present is something I've been kind of playing with for about three years. This is the first stab, so I fully expect some revisions and I look forward to your discussions about maybe better ways to pull these apart. 
But the similarities, they both organize information, frames and narratives. They both share the ability to be used for comprehension and persuasion. And possibly more important, they're both used consistently by stakeholders within the policy debate. But while they're similar, they also differ. And so what I want to do is plot framing conceptualizations on a field defined by factors that differentiate the core concepts of frames and narratives to try and better locate some of these conceptualizations that are in the literature. So the first factor that I think differenti differentiates the two is temporality. So a temporal structure or reliance on time is one of the defining features of narrative as certain events must occur before other events in order for a cause and effect relationship to take place. Thematic frames, because they exist at a higher topic level of meaning, exist outside of this temporal framework. So conflict, scientific uncertainty, that's a frame, it's a theme, but it's not reliant on time. However, some of the frame constructs that do attempt to leverage storylines, like narrative frames or story skeletons, do kind of approach this temporal relationship. So I think the dependence of a construct on temporal structure can serve as one of these assessment factors. The second one I'm calling specificity. So narrative communication uses specifics to communicate about generalities. So it's the specific choices made by characters within the story that give the, meaning it's the narrative its meaning. Thematic frames are powerful because of their lack of specifying content. So these overarching frames gain influence because of the varied content that can still fit in the message and give you that, the overall theme, overarching frame. But content specific frames, such as loss and gain frames that we talked about, do tend to dictate specific content. So that's shifting again more towards the specificity side. So here we have this model. We have two axes. So the horizontal axis is the axis of temporality. So on the left, we have constructs that are not dependent on time at all. And as we move to the right, we get to constructs that are very time dependent. The vertical axis is the axis of specificity. So at the bottom, we have uh, constructs that are not very specific. But as we go up, it, has m it dictates more specificity about the content of the message. And so in the lower left, we have thematic frames, which are very um, not time dependent and also not that specific. Uh, you can see we have content dependent frames up there, temporal dependent frames over there, and narratives in the upper right, which again, are very specific content and also time dependent. And so this dotted line that bisects it, um, I'm trying to say that we can't, we can't just define and say this is a narrative and this is a frame you know, put on the borders. It's th there's still this fuzzy gradient. But what this line is trying to show is as we go more towards the upper right, we start to get more to narrative-like constructs. And as we go to the lower left, we get to more frame-like constructs. OK, so this last part, a um, couple minutes left. Um, so on this framework, what I want to show is I want to begin plotting some of these ethical dimensions to show how it, it might be useful to separate these two out. Um, so returning to the ethics of framing, we have the four principles of ethically using frames. Um, the first two, frame to promote dialogue instead of top-down communication and avoid frames designed to attack or alienate key publics. I don't really see much between the spread of frames and narratives that confuse those two. So I think those probably can probably stay standard based on this framework. <coughs> but third one, maintain accuracy, I think is interesting. I mean, it seems pretty obvious that we should always be accurate to stay true to the science. Um, thematic frames permit context-free accuracy. So if this fact is accurate, and if putting them together gives an accurate representation, um, it's, it's pretty straightforward to maintain accuracy. But narratives introduce additional complexities. So the accuracy of a narrative is judged both by its external accuracy, how much does the narrative uh, relate to the external world, but also its contextual accuracy. And this is, uh, this is separated by uh, the constructs of external narrative realism. So even if a narrative consists of completely accurate information, everything is in there is accurate, if it, doesn't, uh, if, if, if it doesn't hold coherence, if it's not contextually accurate, the narrative could be rejected. 
There's also constraints of maintaining an experiential narrative within the appropriate length. Um, so because uh, a narrative is basically a mental simulation, a two-minute narrative cannot accurately describe any period longer than two minutes, right? Now, in practice, what you do is you don't, when you tell a story, you don't tell everything because that, that's boring. You want to take out the <coughs> interesting and useful, relevant parts and put them together. And so by doing that, that allows someone to tell a story about any length of time in two minutes. But what that does is those, those omissions still reduce the accuracy. Now, often this doesn't matter, right? Often you can, you can do that, but there are some interesting effects. So for instance, the CSI effect, um, where jurors are basically less likely to accept forensic evidence because after watching CSI, they have a different idea of what forensic evidence should be. One of those is the truncated length of time it takes to get results. So on CSI, I can't accurately show you that it takes this long to run, run a test, but to make it interesting, I'll truncate that time. Still accurate, I mean, not always, but let's say it is. Um, it, it still could be an accurate representation, but then the expectation is I can get that result in that much time, and therefore I'm not going to convict this person, or I will. Then there's also, um, because narrative-like constructs communicate through specifics that are then generalized to abstractions, you have the accuracy of representativeness. So there's, that is still a valid ethical consideration when choosing thematic frames. Does the thematic frame accurately represent what we're talking about? But the stakes increase when moving towards the narrative-like constructs because they intrinsically lead to stereotyping of specific uh, events. So is the narrative accurate, um, contextually accurate, omission accurate, but the generalizations that come from that one example, is that going to be representative? Moving to the fourth one, clearly explain the values underlying frame choices. Because narratives communicate through character experience, they really state the underlying values. And within narrative persuasion, one of the variables that actually counters the effects of narrative is by um, letting people know the reason for the narrative. So for instance, um, when someone is transported in the narrative, they're really involved mentally in the narrative world. If there is something that, that basically reveals why the narrative is being written, it's um, based on this purpose, or this is the, the reason for writing it. People pull out of the narrative and then look at the narrative as an object, and then switch back into the, logic, the logical argumentation mode. And so by doing that, it can, re it can uh, negate much of the emotional and experiential benefits of narrative communication. So to follow this ethical consideration, it might be necessary to explain the values outside of the narrative framework. So there is some uh, studies that are looking at the role of post-narrative epilogues on narrative comprehension. So I'll let you have your full transportation experience. Now that it's done, now we can talk about the values. Which bring us to the question, should scientists use narrative at all? Um, while frames are unavoidable, narratives are a choice. And it's possible that because the perceptions of science so closely align with logic-based argumentation, that scientists using the narrative pathway will be perceived as violating deeply held normative expectations. So Bruner actually expands on this, and he says, a scientist caught using the presupposition or subjectification common in narrative, such as by using ambiguous statements or withholding data for effect, would be called a charlatan, while a novelist could not maintain reader involvement without them. Scientific facts are praised for their context independence, while works of literature are praised for their context sensitivity. And on top of this, the effects of narratives remain hard to predict. So in 2008, there was a large meta-study that looked at narrative persuasion um, studies, tried to combine it all, and the, the overall result, one of the overall results was that we know so little about how narratives will influence an individual's thinking that it is unethical to use them in health-related situations. That being said, other communicators within the debate will likely use narratives. And so the choice to avoid them completely may represent a capitulation of influence to those who do. So in summary, while this discussion has offered ethical considerations, these are things that, that I think might be interesting. I think what is, what's next important is to look 
at the expectations that the public actually has. So what does the public policymakers, whatever stakeholders we're interested in, what are their expectations of framing? What are their expectations of thematic frames? What are their expectations of narratives? How do they respond when these enter the, the debate? And so that's, that's a, the next step of the project I hope to work on. We plan to use this framework to map the normative expectations that exist. And the, the end goal would be to probably have some guidelines or some better understanding that we could offer scientists. In these situations, um, these are the expectations that you need to take into account when communicating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker, or uh, uh, respondent, is uh, Dr. Clark Wolf. He's a professor of philosophy in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies here at ISU, and he's director of the bioethics program. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank the organizers of this program for doing it, and especially for inviting me um, to be here. It's a real pleasure, and I want to thank Michael, because I really have enjoyed this project. Uh, Michael has, has provided us a, a, a rich discussion and a valuable framework for understanding the role of frames uh, in and narratives in communication. Um, and two of the important claims he makes are, are these. Right? One, people commonly conflate frames and narratives, although these can be usefully distinguished. And Second, an, an understanding of this distinction can help to improve science communication and perhaps to reduce the rate of public misinterpretation, misunderstanding, and rejection of scientific information that, that uh, would be well-founded uh, if accepted. What I'd like to do here, I, I, um, by way of instigating discussion, um, I'm going to provide a somewhat broader context for the understanding of frame and narrative. At least I hope and think it's a little... Uh, a little broader. Um, I want to consider some alternative distinctions for the taxonomy and evaluation of frames from the ones that, that Michael has offered us here. Um, and I'm going to offer also two suggestions for the modification of the model that, that Michael has offered. On the way through here, though, you know, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. I'm going to give you a definition of spin. I'm going to at least try it out on you. One of the things that I often tell students is that it's important to be willing to say absurd things in a context of intelligent people who will tell you that you're wrong, if you are. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. So here's a standard account of, uh, of what frames are uh, and how they work. A frame is the mode of presentation distinguishable from the matter that's being presented. This is a problematic way of s articulating the distinction um, because different frames typically do include different information. Uh, and the different content can't neatly be distinguished from presentational mode. I regularly tell my students that it really, you know, the, the requirement for writing clearly is not just a requirement to present your ideas in a certain way. When you, uh, when you clarify your ideas and present them clearly, you've actually changed the content of, uh, of what you communicate. So I don't think it's easy to distinguish between a mode and a content in this way. But here's an example, right? Uh, an example of a frame. This is a descendant of one that comes from Tversky and Kahneman uh, long, long ago when they introduced uh, the framing debate. Um, and it, you know, the medical procedure. You have a, uh, physicians present uh, medical al alternatives in different ways uh, to patients. So if I say, if you have this procedure, there's a 20% chance of death. I've offered you a negative frame. I could say, I could communicate the same information to you in a positive way. If you have this procedure, there's an 80% chance of full recovery. A lost frame is a species of negative claim, but it's another kind of, uh, of negative claim, right? If you don't have this procedure, you face a 30% chance of death. Uh, if you do have this procedure, you have a 70% chance of full recovery. It's a gain frame. Now, it turns out, surprise, surprise, patients respond very differently to the same information when it's presented in a different, in a, in a different mode. Um, I find it remarkable that this information is, is out there and physicians have not taken it, taken it seriously. So physicians generally don't 
know the, you know, the information about framing, at least in my experience they don't, and they don't take it into account in the advice that they give to patients. Uh, and I think this is absolutely shocking given that you know, the out uh, medical outcomes really do crucially depend on the way these things uh, are communicated. Um, I, I think there's an issue in framing uh, that arises in other philosophical contexts. When we think about the frame that we're using to articulate what we're saying, we're ascending to another level of thought, right? We're taking as the object of thought the content that we're uh, saying, uh, that we're articulating in another, uh, at another level. So just to make this clear, at level one, I say to you, I make a, I make a claim to you. At the next level, I might reflect on your likely response to what I say to you, right? So reflecting on your likely response to my message, I say the same thing to you, but I frame it in a mode that makes it more likely that you'll accept it. Right? At the next level, recognizing that I've chosen mo mode Y in response to my evaluation to you, you regard Y as spin and you reject X because you frame my expression as a sneaky effort to gain your assent to X. Level four, anticipating the possibility that you will frame my expression as spin, I take pains to couch it in terms that will prevent you from doing so, right? Different ways I might do this. I might con conceal my frame, right? Sneakily conceal the mode of presentation that I'm, uh, that I'm using. Or I might do it by honesty, by sort of honestly presenting to you the information that informs my choice of frame. Uh, so I do think that the choice between these alternatives is both strategically charged, but it's also ethically charged. Right? Uh, it's, a, it's a strategic point, right? because uh, your acceptance of the proposition that I assert to you may crucially depend on you know, the mode of presentation and the way I answer this fourth level question. Um, but it's also an ethical question because m spin involves manipulation and manipulating another person through causing them to accept propositions or you know, messages that they might otherwise reject is an ethically charged thing to do, prima facie morally wrong thing to do. Uh, I do think we could keep going, right? So recognizing that I've taken pains to avoid being dismissed as a spinster, spinster, you evaluate my claims with extra care. I think we could go higher. Now, in philosophical contexts, there are lots of places where uh, regresses like this or ascents, semantic ascents, uh, arise. Um, and often people say, well, it's a theoretical problem. It doesn't really arise pragmatically, practically in the context uh, of ordinary conversation. I think this is false. I think we regularly think at a number of different levels. Anytime you evaluate whether someone, uh, someone is spinning a message to you, you're thinking at a fairly deep level uh, of analysis. And I think we re regularly think six or seven levels deep. Uh, and it's so effortless to do it that we don't even reflect on this uh, as we're engaged in it. I think this issue of discursive ascent uh, gives us a way of thinking about spin. And I want to introduce this as a thought. Uh, so again, this is something I'm trying out on on you all. Um, I think perhaps spin is distinguished by the fact that it involves a consciously chosen and a consciously concealed effort to frame. So I spin my message to you when I frame it in a certain way and I conceal my framing choice to you, from you. Uh, if so, then the effort to avoid being taken as a spinster can be done either through more effective concealment, right? I can very effectively conceal the message that I've got to, to offer you or through openness and candor. The choice between these alternatives, ag again, I think it's both strategically charged and, and morally charged. Um, when I was looking over this, lo and behold, it just occurred to me, right, that uh, Immanuel Kant uh, has uh, a principle that, that seems relevant in this context. He uh, calls it his transcendental formula of public right and it appears in the essay Perpetual Peace. Uh, and this is not quite the language that Kant used, but it's pretty close, uh, actually. I think his language is embedded in metaphysical presuppositions that we don't need to, uh, to involve ourselves in here. Actions affecting the rights of other people are wrong 
if their effectiveness requires that the agent's reasons not be public. Right? Think about that just for a moment, right? Actions involve affecting the rights of other people are wrong if their effectiveness requires that the reasons not be public. In perpetual peace, Kant considers this in the context of international treaties. So he regards this as a, a reason against secret treaties. Right? Secret treaties are wrong, why? Well, according to Kant, they're wrong because they can't, be, they can't work if they're made public. Uh, it seems to me that something similar to this um, might be considered, at least, as an alternate recommendation for uh, the morality of, of framing decisions. So Nisbet's two, 2009 article offers us guiding principles for framing decisions. And my suggestion is that we might consider adding this publicity requirement to this list as an ethical but not strategic requirement. So publicity in, is involved, I think, in Nisbet's conditions three and four, but I don't think it's identical to them. I think um, clearly explaining the values and maintaining accuracy are, are crucial, but the idea of pu publicity, the idea that my message and the frame that I've chosen can work, even if you understand the reasons underlying my choice of frame, uh, uh, is, I think, an independent requirement. We can talk about that. Accuracy, I think, I mean, there, there is malicious truth-telling, and there, is, there are cases of manipulative truth-telling. So I don't think uh, accuracy uh, guarantees that our interaction will be uh, non-manipulative in, in a way that avoids spin. So now I want to turn more directly to um, Michael Dahlstrom's model here uh, uh, that offers a way of distinguishing frames and narratives. Um, I think this is a very useful model, and uh, I am going to offer some divergent suggestions, um, but again, I don't think there's one single way to uh, divide the discursive uh, uh, language here. Uh, so I don't think that there's you know, a platonic form that fixes the meaning of the term frame so that there's a single best way to specify or analyze it. Rather, I think there's, you know, the term frame is a vague term, and there will be a variety of ways to specify a, a disambiguated meaning that may be uh, appropriate and relevant. So in that sense, I am suggesting some divergent interpretations, but I don't think they're, uh, I don't take them to be, you know, uh, debate-type refutations or anything like that. So here's, here's another thought about distinguishing frames and identifying their, their function. Um, I think we can distinguish a presenter or performer's objective in making a statement or expression from the mode that's presented, uh, that's employed to, to achieve this objective. I would like to identify the presentational frame as the second of these. So the frame is the mode in, employed to achieve not necessarily a message, right, a message or a communicative action is a kind of action that is subject to framing, but there's a broad range of different human actions that get framed and that require us to think about the context in which our actions affect other people. Uh, in this sense, I think an interpretation of a Chopin nocturne is a frame in a certain sense. It uh, is a way, is a mode of presentation that informs the way that performative action is received by an audience. Um, in the context of framing, I do think that it's important to distinguish active framing and passive framing, uh, and performative and receptive framing. So let me say something about these, uh, these two distinctions. Um, performative uh, framing involves framing the message that we're communicating to other people, right? Framing the message we hope to convey. But when we receive messages, our reception of those messages is often informed by psychological factors of which we may or may not be aware. So our lang the language that's used, whether I'm speaking German or French, whether I'm speaking, uh, whether I'm using philosoph philosophical terminology, whether I'm using the language of rhetoric, can influence the way that um, uh, my message is received. Um, and under many circumstances, we may be unconscious of the factors that influence our reception of a message. So I don't think patients generally realize that they respond, that we respond differently to gain-framed versus loss-framed 
um, presentations. In fact, you know, you might strike your head and say, my gosh, it's the same information presented in a different mode. How can it be that I respond differently to it? I think often when we bring to consciousness, sort of searchlight consciousness, the considerations that have informed our framing of information that's presented to us, it's often surprising. Um, so examples of this, a speaker anticipates the disposition of the audience and frames the message to, to suit. Or a listener reflects on the funding source of the speaker and takes this inform information into account when processing or evaluating the message. Um, so that's performative and, and receptive, whether I'm giving you a message or receiving a message from you. Um, I think the active and passive distinction is also a crucial one. Right? So our framing is active when we're making framing the object of our, our reflective judgment. When I select a mode of presentation based on my evaluation of my audience, I'm being active uh, in selecting a frame. There's concern, right? Many, many people, as Michael pointed out, uh, in the scientific community regard active framing as spin and think that science should have none of this. Uh, I think there's no reason to regard active framing as spin. Uh, there is good reason to regard manipulative or deceptive framing as spin, but I think that's, a, that's another uh, distinction. Um, our framing is passive when our deli delivery or receipt is informed by factors of which we're not aware. Um, some examples of this. Uh, Dan Kahan, who's a law professor at uh, Yale, has shown how different cultural identities inform receptiveness to information of different kinds. Uh, and Kahan's I think it's interesting that physicians have not, while lawyers have, taken framing information very seriously. I think it's not surprising, right? Um, my ability to persuade a jury may crucially dep depend on my understanding uh, what that jury uh, believes and how they'll, they're likely to accept what, I, what I'm saying, uh, where physicians may, be more, may have less personally at stake uh, in, in framing outcomes. Um, Nisbet has suggested in, uh, in his recent uh, work ways in which scientists ourselves are subject to passive or unreflective ideological framing of the issues that they may tend to communicate. And um, in response to this, I, um, I found this, I'm, I'm sure some of you have seen it, I, I, bet, uh, I bet you've seen it, Matthew. Um, Chris Mooney, who's someone I, you know, I, I, I respect uh, Mooney's work and his judgment on this, but this, I have to say, this surprised me a little bit. Uh, Mooney writes, I don't accept the validity of the comparison uh, between scientists, evangelicals, and Tea Party years with respect to how they think about scientific topics in particular, uh, which are the topics that are, that are is at issue here. So again, Mooney's responding to this thought that scientists themselves are subject to ideological to passive ideological framing uh, when, uh, we, when, when they communicate the things that they've, uh, or accept propositions that involve their area of specialization. I'm not saying that anyone's capable of being 100% unbiased, but I am saying that scientists evaluate scientific claims and also claims about expertise using the norms of their profession, precisely because they have neural circuits for doing so laid down by many years of experience, which other groups don't have. And so scientists can be liberal overall, which the makes them like academics in general, and they can have their biases and blind spots, and yet also have methodolo methodologies that they apply in their realms uh, of, of knowledge. So just a thought on that. I read Mooney as claiming that scientists' training renders them less likely to fall prey to ideological framing. Um, I think he's wrong about this. I think it's just fundamentally wrong. Uh, my experience working with scientists simply doesn't support this, this thought. Now, I want to admit this is anecdotal evidence, and I, I don't mean to give it more weight than it deserves as an anecdote. Um, on the other hand, I do think there are contexts where there is really thoroughly independent evidence that ideological biases sometimes strongly influence scientific practice. And I would point you all toward one of the best books I've recently read, which is Cordelia Fine's excellent book, Delusions of Gender, uh, in which she carefully 
dissects the work of neuroscientists working on the biophysical foundations of gender uh, and shows, you know, I, I, I found it a, you know, a, a press to the wall, nail in the coffin case, really shows that um, much of this expressly scientific work has been deeply informed. So I'm gonna end with just a couple of divergent suggestions from, uh, that, that focus on uh, Michael's uh, remarks. So uh, my first suggestion is that the relationship between narrative and frame may be more like the relation between genus and species and not like the relation between different species. I think the way Michael has uh, you know, divided the turf indicates that frame and narr narrative are distinguished as different entities rather than having a part-whole relationship. I think this follows from the way I've defined frame. Um, but as I said, I don't think the way I've defined frame is the uniquely appropriate way to, you know, to, uh, to do this. I think it's a vague term and we have multiple possible specifications of it. Um, my other thought is that uh, Dahlstrom uses the, uh, the vertical axis uh, of specificity. When I think of specificity, I think of specificity versus vagueness. And it seems to me that this axis doesn't quite capture what distinguishes non-narrative frames from narrative frames. Um, it seems to me that some frames, non-narrative frames, may be absolutely specific. If I use percentages uh, in different ways to frame outcomes, I'm using a language that is absolutely specific and precise. Um, so I'm an, I'd like to suggest that um, we might usefully replace this uh, this axis with an axis of abstractness versus com uh, concreteness. That frames, non-narrative frames tend to be abstract in a way that narratives are not. Narratives tie uh, ideas to concrete uh, reality. So that's the, those are the last two suggestions that I'd like to leave you with and we'll open up for discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> Michael, that, that was uh, uh, Michael. That was an excellent uh, presentation, and um, you grapple with this difference between frames and narrative, which has been discussed since I was in graduate school, 1999 to 2003. And I think your your paper, as you develop it, I think it would be very useful. It's some of the best work I've seen in terms of discussion. So, um, but I wanted to uh, talk about um, uh, Chris Mooney's comments on uh, the idea that uh, scientists are immune to their own ideology. Um, and um, you know the the point of the report was not so much to actually look at how ideology shapes scientists' view of science, sci uh, the the actual research related to climate change, but rather how ideology shapes uh, the views of scientists when it comes to understanding the complexities of climate change politics. Uh, this framing process of how do they attribute what are the major barriers to societal action on climate change. Why is it we tend to focus overwhelmingly, for example, on the role of conservative think tanks, as was mentioned before, the Marshall Institute, which has a $400,000 a year budget, uh, and overlook uh, major other factors, such as have we pursued the right policy, what's been the role of the economy, uh, the polarizing qualities with my political leaders, et cetera. So <coughs> the, uh, the data itself is actually pretty clear that ideology does shape the members of AAAS, even how they view the science of climate change. So as I talk about in the report, among scientists doing work on climate science, there's no disagreement. You know, regardless of ideology, 97% of scientists working in the field of climate science agree that climate change is real and that humans are a cause. But when you look at non-specialists, members of AAAS, who uh, some of them, half of them don't have a PhD, they work in science-related fields. What's interesting is that roughly 90% of those who self-identify as liberal or very liberal believe that climate change is real. Uh, something like 80% of moderates and something like less than 50% of conservatives. So the <coughs> ideological variation, it's clear from non-specialists, members of AAAS, that ideology is shaping even their perceptions of the reality of, of climate change. And that ideological variation is even greater when you ask them about the seriousness of climate change, where there's even strong variation between moderates 
in liberals. Only a little bit more than 50% of moderates believe that climate change is a very serious problem compared to something like 80% of, of lib liberals. So there's something about the identity of being a scientist or in the field of, of this political community of AAAS where on top of being concerned and working within a field related to science, ideology adds to your perception of the reality and the seriousness of the problem. But then the divide is even greater when it comes to what events related to the politics of climate change do you pay attention to? So when asked in the survey, um, how much have you heard about claims that the Bush administration has interfered with science, something like 90% of those that self-identified as liberal said they had heard a lot uh, compared to something like 60% of moderates and 25% of, of conservatives. So that, select, that suggests that there's a lot of selective information seeking and attention to these claims of politicization and the only way to really account for that is based on political identity. Um, and then if you were able to ask a series of other questions, I'll just end on this one note that the way that I got the idea for looking at the AAAS data, my colleague Gietram Scheufler had published um, uh, a paper looking at nanotechnology scientists, people working in the field of nanotechnology. And what was interesting is that nanotechnology scientists uh, viewed the, the risks of nanotechnology as greater than the public, and they thought there was a lot of uncertainty mm -hmm. about those risks. But when they asked the nanotechnology scientists what should be done about those risks, should we have more regulation or not, ideology, whether people were on the left of the spectrum, on the right of the spectrum, was one of the strongest predictors of whether or not the scientists supported regulation. So that's a clear example when it comes to making sense of the complexities of what should be done politically, ideology strongly shapes and colors the views of, of scientists. So I think the mistake where Chris makes there is that he infers that I'm suggesting that this, the judgment of scientists when it comes to science is inherently faulty because they're ideolo ideological, uh, but when in fact actually scientists working within these specialized fields have built-in training and norms that help correct for that ideology, but scientists outside of those fields, ideology not only plays a role in how they view that area of science and its reality, but more importantly, how they make sense of the complexities of the political conditions surrounding that issue. Can I just respond uh, uh, momentarily to, to one part of that? It seems to me that um, one of the things we see in, in framing and ideological effects is not that rational processes become irrational necessary, necessarily, but that our rational processes are put in the service of underlying values that reflect our ideological commitments. So Jonathan Haidt at the University of Virginia shows ways in which our moral reasoning is kind of put at the service of different goals that we might have as the result of other, uh, other underlying uh, commitments. And I think the same thing might apply in areas of science. So one doesn't need to think that the pro process of science is itself irrational or that people are doing uh, inappropriate work to think that there are underlying framing effects, uh, un you know, underlying values that passively influence people's choice of where to use those, uh, those expert uh, ca capabilities. It seems to me highly unlikely that 20% chance of death from a medical procedure would be equivalent to 80% chance of full recovery. There should be lots of intermediate uh, cases uh, ranging from living as a vegetable to being about the same as you were before you started or being a little bit better. So if a doctor told me I had 20% chance of death, I would imagine that I had a much larger chance of some less than perfect outcome. Uh, 
did you really mean that as, as a good <laughs> example? No, I, I think you're exactly right. That, that's just the, uh, the hypothetical example to show that equivalent numbers can have different effects. But I think in an actual context, you're right, there's more than just two sides. I do think that those studies have been redone with some of uh, those complexities added to just mm -hmm. to clear up some of the, the noise. Well, sure. So a lot of science s seems to be intentionally um, formulating narratives. Uh, I mean, uh, especially things that have to do with history of the Earth, evolution, geosciences, cosmology. I mean, any given, it, it's, it, it's based on deductive reasoning and logical interpretation of observations, but, um, but this, those aren't very interesting until they're put into a narrative which has huge impact on um, the public consciousness and imagination. Imagine what we know about dinosaurs and stuff. Um, and on, you know, our evolution of humans and, and whatever. Um, so, so it's kind of a narrative science that's also framed and given to to the public as a narrative. And this is a really open-ended question, but I'm just wondering. And these have uh, implications for climate change and other things, too. So I'm just kind of open-endedly asking, what do we think of that? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. There's, there's many examples of, of facts or statistics that have lived for years until someone has put it into a narrative that actually grabs someone's attention before it actually had effect. And I think um, there is... There's a small environmental movement to try and say, you know, rather than logically argue about sustainability, um, actually it's more, I think it's more about evolution. Rag rather than logically argue about evolution, sustainability, the, the state of nature, um, they propose that we should construct a narrative, a grand narrative about how the world came to be. Basically to say, look, here's a narrative that involves evolution, that involves sustainability, and as long as we can accept that as a narrative, that can get the goals across. Now, I don't think they've actually created a narrative. I think it's, right now, it's to the point of saying this is something we should do to move the process forward. But I think you're exactly right. I think that process, and that's where, that's where we need people, we need storytellers to be able to say, I see the facts that aren't that interesting, but I'm interested in them, and so I can put it into a format that you process it narratively and actually experience it. Uh, this is just something maybe you can help me out with. There's, uh, you know, the IPCC uses climate change scenarios. And they're very, very important, you know, in playing out and helping us make decisions. And I was confused where those framings <laughs> or narratives. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> and depending on how I change my model based on the... Uh, <laughs> but. I, I don't know, I would probably say those are more narrative-like because it is dependent on time. You say, if this happens, we might move into this and we might move into this. But uh, I think another, another issue I didn't really talk about, um, there's a lot of research that looks at how to get someone transported into the narrative because that's really the linchpin. I mean, I can present you with the narrative, but until you become transported, it has, it's no different than anything else. And so um, some of the things that, that break that transportation is, like I said, when you understand why it's being given to you. So if the scenario, if by reading the scenario it's obvious that I'm reading the scenario because they want me to be scared about this to respond this way, then you look at the narrative as an object. So it, it needs to be written in a way that still involves, involves the reader to get the effect. That's a good question, but I'd, I'd probably push that more towards the narrative-like side. Um, I'd, I'd say something about this. I, it seems to me that um, those alternative scenarios right now, as described in the IPCC reports, they're fairly thin, right? On the other hand, I saw a presentation by Paul Baer, who's now um, at uh, Georgia Tech in science... I, I don't know what area he's in. He's sort of a polymath. But one of the things that he did was to take those alternative IPC scenarios and associate them with specific environmental changes that would take place were those scenarios to fall out, right? And at various stages, he described what this would mean for the oceans, what this would mean for the coral, what this would mean for 
you know, the Arctic. Uh, and that turned those, you know, those data sets into something that really was a narrative. And I can tell you it was gripping. So it, it sort of was the, you know, the, the loss frame. It's the, it's the terrorize the audience frame narrative, but it worked. <laughs> I was terrified. So I think we will wrap up and thank our guests and we we can be back here at two thirty. Oh sure. Oh sure. Oh sure. Oh sure. Oh sure. Oh sure. Oh sure.